Well, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. I wore my red sweater just for you today. Don't particularly like... Okay, never mind. Well, with all the focus today, this weekend on love, I decided that I would do a little bit of a break from the book of Romans, although I'm going to read a couple of verses for you from Romans. We are not to this passage yet in Romans. We'll get there, God willing. I wanted to take a little break and just talk about genuine love this morning, comparing it to some of the popular ideas of culture. But look at these verses. Uh, They're going to put them up on the screen for me. This is Romans 5, verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the for the what? The ungodly. It goes on to say in the next verse, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, someone who always does what's right, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us, his own love for us, his type of love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I'll use that this morning as kind of a springboard to talk about genuine love today. But before I, before I just launch into this and, and talk about this, let me just say that I know that Valentine's Day can be, can be a particularly painful day for some of you this morning, either watching or sitting here live today. As a matter of fact, anytime we focus on any particular holiday or any particular theme in the Bible, uh, there's always going to be someone in the room that feels like maybe they're being left out or, or they're hurt because if we talk about Mother's Day, their mother's gone, or Father's Day, their father's gone, or whatever it is, or even Christmas and Thanksgiving can be very painful times for many, many people. And so I know that for some of you today, this could be a painful day for you because I know that there are some in the room who you've lost a spouse uh, through death. Some of you have gone through bitter and painful divorces. And you feel the sting of that. You feel the sting of that that rejection or that pain or that loneliness. Uh, Some of you are not in relationship right now romantically, and you long to be. You would desperately love to find that one special person to do life with. There's some this morning watching or or listening that uh, you're you're in a very difficult marriage. Uh, The person you live with is just not that easy to live with. Or maybe you're that person. (laughs) And your marriage is just painful, and it's, it's difficult, and it's a challenge. And then there's all kinds of other situations and circumstances that are represented here this morning. Some of us, maybe some of us among us are older, and, and uh, really your, your spouse has been gone a number of years, but you just still, you feel that loneliness. The, the truth of the matter is that the principles I'm talking about today apply to every single part of our life regardless of our current romantic circumstances. God made us to love and to be loved. It's part of being made in the image of God. The Bible says, sorry, having technical difficulty this morning. The Bible says God is love. That is his very essence, his very nature. And God made us in his image, and we have a deep yearning within all of our hearts to love and to be loved. We were made for relationship with God and other people. And having been made in his image means that we do long. And there, there may be some of you this morning really longing for that soulmate as people talk about. But let me just begin by reminding you of something this morning. While all of us want to have loving relationships with people and to be close and to have someone special, let me just remind you that The only true soulmate is the Lord God himself. He's the one who formed our soul. He made our soul, and he made us for him. He made us for him first and foremost. So the primary needs of my heart, the primary needs of my emotional well-being 
are met first and foremost in my relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ as I look to him and depend on the Holy Spirit because I was made first and foremost for him. I've learned that as I learn to depend on the Lord fully and not look to you or to my wife or to my family or someone else to provide my sense of worth, well-being, and emotional stability, I have learned I'm able to love even when I'm not feeling necessarily loved. Because the Holy Spirit is able to meet the needs deep within me and remind me of the truth of who I am and provide the strengthening that I need to be able to love. I'll say more about that at the end this morning. That doesn't mean that we don't need other people. Not saying that, am I? Not whatsoever. The scripture tells us we're made for relationships and we should seek relationships with others, but we just seek the Lord first and foremost as primary And that's, by the way, that's why we emphasize small groups, life groups, and serve teams, getting on a team and being a part, getting in a group. We emphasize that because all of us need to find good, close relationships where we can love and be loved for who we are, kind of do life together. That's why we tell you, get involved, get plugged in. Don't just come on Sunday morning and fill a chair. Don't just sit in your bathrobe and watch eating your Dunkin' Donut while we're doing church. I get plugged in somewhere because the Lord meets our need, whatever our romantic circumstances, whatever our family circumstances, God provides for us through the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. If we truly enter in and learn to love, we can be loved in that context as we look to the Lord to help us. So regardless of our romantic circumstances this morning, We can love and be loved. And let me just throw this in quickly before I get to the main thought here this morning. You know, as wonderful as marriage and family is, and it is certainly a good thing, it is a gift from the Lord. But listen to me. If we're not careful, marriage and family or romance can become an idol in our lives when it begins to be more important than our relationship with the Lord himself. You know, Jesus actually said, meek and mild Jesus said, unless you hate your father and mother, unless you hate your wife and children, unless you hate your brothers and sisters, in fact, unless you hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. What? What on earth is Jesus telling us? Is he telling us he wants us to hate? Of course not. Jesus is teaching by comparison and by contrast. And he's saying, listen, you can get the romance you want. You can get the sex you want. You can get the relationships you want. You can get the money you want. But if you don't have me, if I'm not the first and primary thing in your life, you've missed it. And you can't follow me. It's kind of like the rich young guy that came to Jesus. He loved his money more than he wanted to love Jesus. And so Jesus said, okay, then you can't follow me. I just caution you. Marriage is good. Love relationships are great. That's all wonderful. And God, may God bless you with that. But don't make it an idol in your life that you pursue that more than you pursue the Lord himself. Okay, I'll move on. I just thought I would... Start there this morning. (laughs) So genuine love. What in the world is genuine love? Well, of course, I believe the Bible reveals to us many, many things about life and about us. And one of the things it tells us, one of the things the Bible shows us, God's word, absolute truth, shows us what genuine love is. What is it? Number one, genuine love is an evaluation, not just an attraction. It's an evaluation, not just an attraction. You know, it goes something like this. Yeah, I just, I saw them across the room and our eyes met and it was love at first sight. It was, ooh, man, I I still just get tingly thinking about it. Now, I remember one time when I was uh, in between college and high school, I, I was a, uh, an intern youth pastor down in Port Arthur, Texas for a, a summer before I went to school, and, and I, I saw this young lady. Her name was, you ready for this? Paula. <laughs> Come on, Paula and Paula. Can I get an amen from all the baby boomers out there? 
Yeah, and boy, it was like instant attraction, instant connection. It was unbelievable. And about two or three weeks into it, I realized, you know what? Not only did I not really love her, I didn't even really know her. I was super attracted to her. I didn't really know her. And so how could I really love her when I didn't really absolutely know her? You see, genuine love is an evaluation, not just an attraction. The word to evaluate means to make a judgment about the value of someone or something. To make a judgment about the value of something. And we make a judgment about the value of other people when we truly get to know who they are. When we find out what their values are. When we find out what it is that drives them. How do they act when they're under stress or pressure? How do they deal with their anger? How do they treat other people? Are they selfish and manipulative? What are they truly like? You can be super attracted to someone and you may be attracted to the person that's the worst person on the planet in terms of your your health and your well-being and your relationship. It's not just an attraction. So that's great that you're attracted. We'll talk about that in a second. Placing value. I brought this excellent painting today to show you. Uh, this, this has great value to me. This painting has great value to me, not because it would sell for a lot of money at an art exhibit. This has great value to me because my dad painted that picture when he was in his 80s somewhere. And so that has value to me. I have several others. That has no value to you whatsoever. But guess what? It does to me. Why? Because I've placed value on it. I've determined that this picture has value. And that's what real love does. Real love places value on an evaluation of other people. You know, sometimes people meet and they see each other and it's instant connection and and it does work out and they have a lifelong marriage. But I would argue that the reason is not because they had that instant attraction. I would argue it's because over time they really came to truly know one another and truly see the value of one another and build that relationship. How does the Bible reveal this truth? Well, think about John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now, just think about that for a minute. God so loved the world? God so loved Adolf Hitler that he gave his only son. So that Adolf Hitler would have repented. What? For God so loved the world Did God love all of our attitudes? Did God love all of our actions? Was God attracted to all of our behaviors and the the motives of our hearts? No, as a matter of fact, he hated them. And yet Romans 5 and 6 that we read earlier says that Christ died for ungodly people. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we were dead, spiritually dead, before we came to Christ. And it says in Ephesians 2 and verse, th- verse 4, or, I'm sorry, verse 3, says that we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. Verse 4 says, even though we deserved his wrath, but because of his love for us, God who's rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in sin. Even though God hated our sin, he hated our attitudes and our actions, even though we were under his wrath and deserved his judgment, he still placed value on us because he made us and he loved us based on his evaluation and worth as individual people, not on how we were behaving at that moment. You see, genuine love looks past the exterior to really truly look at who a person is. In 1 John 3, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid his life down for us. And when did he lay his life down for us? Romans 5.10 says, while we were still God's enemies, he laid his life down for us. Love is an evaluation. It's not just an attraction. While God was fully aware of our sin and our sinfulness, he evaluated us and placed value on us and loved us, truly loved us, by coming and dying in our place. He laid down his life for us even though he hated our attitudes and behaviors. That's what real love does. Real love truly loves another person 
Most romantic relationships begin with an attraction. We're attracted to physical appearance or personality or perhaps the differences that seem attractive to us at the time, and that's totally normal and that's perfectly okay. In fact, I hope you're attracted to the person you end up married to. But that attraction is not love. And those feelings of attraction can change and they can increase or decrease. It's just the way it works. It is simply a physical, emotional, or chemical attraction toward them and that can and will change based on any number of things in life. It can change based on an accident or an illness or age. Men lose their hair. Can I get an amen, Pat? (laughs) Or maybe it's through just a lack of good, healthy communication. They simply aren't as appealing as they once were because you're not communicating well with each other. As time goes by, the traits of their personality, the, the differences that once drew you together have become grating annoyances that make you want to lash out in anger. Anybody besides me ever have that happen to you? I'm not talking about my wife right now, necessarily. <laughs> talking about you. No, I'm mean, just back off of that now. Had you, maybe it's an initial powerful attraction, but you've discovered now that that attraction has decreased. That's, that's the way life works sometimes. But that's not love. That's just attraction. And it can increase, it can decrease, it can increase once again. It can change based on our choices, based on our evaluations and behaviors. Genuine love sees who a person is and evaluates them as a person of worth and chooses to love them for who they are, not just how they look or how attractive or how how they're treating us at the time, but it is an evaluation of their worth. If you're dating today, if you're looking for a marriage partner, let me tell you to consider very carefully who the person is that you're dating. Who are they really? I know they put on a good front. I know they say everything you want to hear. Well, what's their character really like? Are they a moral person? Are they a follower of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, are they kind? Are they uh, inclined to selfishness, manipulation, and lying? No matter how strongly you're attracted to them, make sure you evaluate them carefully before you take the plunge into a committed relationship with them and you'll save yourself a whole lot of heartache in this life. So if you're dating after an honest evaluation, listen, of their core values... What do they truly value? How do you know that? By what they give their time and energy to, by the words that come out of their mouth consistently over time. If you watch carefully, you can begin to discern who they really are in those situations. And then you begin to say, you know, this person, I do want to love They certainly match my ideals, my values. If their values conflict with yours, if the basic direction of their life is the opposite of yours, do you want to commit to someone who's going the opposite direction that you are? Listen, it 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 will tear at you. This is the most important decision you ever make after you've decided to follow Christ. So use your brain, not just your sensual feelings and attractions. If you're married this morning, I would encourage you to look again at who the person is you're really married to. I know maybe some of the things have become uh, uh, tension between you. Maybe there is some annoyances. How many of you know that we all do annoying things? Everybody who's annoying, lift your hand. I hope your hand's up because we're all annoying to somebody, every one of us. You know, the Bible says love covers over a multitude of sins. That's what the body of Christ, that's what the church ought to look like, a group of people who cover over each other's sins. It's not that we're not aware of them. It's not that we know, don't know they're there. 
but we evaluate them as worthy of love because God loves us and Christ died for us and made us part of his body. So remember again the good things about that person, their character issues which made them appealing to you in the first place. Focus on those things and you'll be able to love them for who they are, not just the attraction you have. Anyone can see the wrong in someone else. All of us are really good at pointing out each other's flaws, weaknesses and our faults. It takes intentional effort and prayer to look for what's really good and right in others despite their faults and practice loving them based on knowledgeable evaluation, not just attraction. So if you're married, here's what I would suggest. Look for the good in them once again. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see them again as a gift from him because that's what you thought at the beginning. It's more your thinking that's changed than reality. Begin to be straightforwardly honest with your spouse about your desires, your values, your thoughts, your perceptions, your feelings. I find in marriage training and counseling that most of the time a couple comes in thinking they just really know each other so well, that they just know each other so good. And, and after a few questions and honest exchange, they find out, well, maybe I didn't know them as good as I thought I did. Why? Because we tend to hide from each other. We tend to not be honest. Begin to speak in I terms. Let them know how you really think, what you really feel, what you're really struggling with, what you'd really like to see. Do it in the moment. Intimacy is built on honesty, and without true intimacy, without true honesty, true intimacy just simply isn't possible. Communicate and share your values, your heart, and then listen to theirs. And your attraction, you may find, begins to grow. I want to recommend some books to you as I go along this morning. I love this book. This is such a practical book. I love it. It's called Rescue Your Love Life. Changing the Dumb Attitudes and Behaviors That Will Sink Your Marriage. I love the the second title. In this book, he encourages us to really speak in terms of I, to learn how to say I, He says, learn the power of I statements. People use I statements when talking about themselves are far better understood than those who say things like, well, you know, you start to feel. Or, uh, well, instead, uh, I would, you know, this is that. Uh, No, he says, make direct statements. I don't like it when you are gone for long periods of time and don't call. I start to feel alone. I want you to call me. Such statements draw the person in, and they are direct expressions of the heart. It goes on. There's lots of great practical stuff in this book, Rescue Your Love Life. A genuine love is, first of all, an evaluation. So if you've lost that love and feeling, that attraction that you once had, I'd encourage you to begin to look again, evaluate again who this person is. Look for the good in them. The person that you're attracted to the most may be the worst person you could possibly be with. Make sure you know who they are. Number two, genuine love is a decision, not a feeling. Genuine love is a choice, not a feeling. Come on, sing it with me. You know it. Let's all sing it together. You've lost that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. Come on, sing it. You've lost that love and feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, come on. You sounded great. That, dear ones, is the deciding determination of our culture about whether or not we stay with someone. 50% of all marriages in America end in divorce. Why? Because they lose that love and feeling. You know what? Deciding to leave your marriage because you lose that loving feeling is like deciding to sell your car because it ran out of gas. No reasonable person sells their car just because they run out of gas. They get the tank refilled and continue Because that's the best car for them in that moment. You've lost that love and feeling. 
That doesn't mean you cannot genuinely love the other person because love is a choice that we make. It's a decision to do what is in the best and highest interest of another person and of that relationship regardless of what I may be feeling like doing at the time. We decide to love when we don't feel like loving. How does the Bible reveal this? Well, on the night of his betrayal in John 13, the Bible says that Jesus, knowing full well that all the disciples were going to forsake him, knowing that Peter was going to deny even knew him, knowing that Jesus was going to sell him for 30 pieces, Jesus knew every bit of that. And yet Jesus laid aside not only his robes, but his feelings. He laid his feelings aside and he washed their feet. Why? The Bible says so that he could show them the full extent of his love, that he loved them even when they weren't being loving at all, when they were doing the opposite of what he wanted. I know Jesus didn't feel like loving them. I just don't feel it, Pastor. I just don't feel it. How would that work for you in other areas of your life? Let's say, oh, you know what? I just don't feel like working anymore. I'm just not working anymore. I know I got a mortgage. I I just don't feel like working. I'm going to quit working. How would that work for you? I just don't feel like being a parent anymore. I know I got five kids, too bad. Don't feel like being a parent. I don't feel like paying taxes anymore. Can I get an amen out there anywhere this morning? How's that working for you? Now, what do you do? You suck it up. Forgive me for that real holy expression. And you begin to think and talk to yourself and say, wait, this isn't right. I've got to get over those feelings and do what I need to do in this situation. Love is not just an emotional feeling or an affection for someone else. It's a decision to do what's in their best and highest interest. And having evaluated them as a person of worth, we place worth on them even when they're not being very lovable at the moment and we don't feel loving woozy woozies for them. We choose to love and honor the relationship commitment with them even when we don't feel like doing it. Our culture is too dependent on its feelings for determining if something is true or false. And I've discovered feelings are not a solid basis on which to determine what's true. My feelings have been deceived too many times. I know better than that. I've got to go to the eternal word of God to know what is really true and bring myself into alignment with it, whether I feel good about it at the moment or not. If we depend on our feelings to determine whether or not we're going to love Before we act in love, our relationships will suffer. We'll never be all that God intends for us to be. Our relationships will never be what God intends. Marriages will never be what they could be if we depend on our feelings to dictate whether or not we love the other person. No relationship will have the loving feelings all the time. It's just not realistic. Our feelings of affection and love for others increase and decrease. They increase and decrease, increase and decrease based largely on our communication with them. If we're communicating regularly and in healthy ways, we'll be able to maintain loving feelings. But if we're communicating poorly or unhealthily or inappropriately, we'll begin to lose those loving feelings and affections that we once had. This is normal and can be expected in every relationship. And let me just say, let me just throw this in here. You and I can harden our hearts. We begin, particularly in marriage, You begin to feel like, you know, they're not loving you the way they used to. They're not giving you what you want or need. We can harden our hearts. And when we harden our hearts, the first place we harden them really is to God. And it hardens to the person and vice versa. You You cannot harden your heart in one area without hardening it in the other. It goes together. We are relational beings. Having a loving relationship requires time It requires intentional thought. It requires effort to maintain the kind of loving affection and feeling that we all long for. Where do you see this in the Bible? Revelation. In the book of Revelation 3, Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, he said to them, you know, you have forsaken your first love. And notice what he said. 
In that text of that church, he talked about their orthodoxy, talked about how they still believed all the right stuff up here. He says, but you've forsaken your first. Notice what he did not say. He didn't say you've lost your first love. That's not what he said. No, he said you've forsaken it. You've stopped loving me. You've stopped doing those things that you should do. And what does he say to do about it? He says, stop and remember, remember how it used to be. And start doing again the things you did at first. Start putting time into your relationship. Start thinking about me again. Start worshiping me again. Start surrendering to me again like you did back there when you first. And then your, your love will be rekindled, he says. And you'll be hot in your love for me. What does this tell us about feelings of love and affection romantically? Well, it tells us that that love and feeling can be stirred up and increased. We can intentionally decide to love and do the loving things that are appropriate and build our relationship with one another. I recommend another little book to you out there on the bookshelf. It's called From This Day Forward, Craig Groeschel, Five Commitments to uh, Fail Proof Your Marriage. Listen to what he says. He says in this text that we should decide to love and that our relationships will be as good as we decide them to be. He says, your marriage is as good as you decide it will be. It takes both, I know, to work things out, but everyone has to start somewhere. I know it's especially hard if only one of you is trying at first, but you have to keep going. You're in this relationship together. Even when it doesn't feel like it, if you're married, God has already made you one. It doesn't matter how it feels. Once God has made you one, you can't be undone. Even if you're the only one committing right now, you decide. You decide what kind of marriage you're going to have. Is it going to be a bad one or is it going to be a good one? You decide. It can be just as good as you decide to have the marriage that God wants you to have. I can promise you that both of you will have to do your share of forgiving And you'll never be more like God than when you forgive. I know you can't do anything to change your spouse, but I also know you can change you. You can do everything you can. Do not give up. You can put yourself in the proper place, surrendering fully to God, seeking him daily, believing him for a miracle, and you can decide to never give up. You're in a covenant, not just with your spouse, but with God. So hang in there. Stay united even when the enemy wants to undo you. Love is a decision, not just a feeling, and our feelings of love can be restored. I know you've lost that loving feeling. Guess what? You can get it back. I know it seems impossible. I know it doesn't seem that it's possible at all. But it is possible because feelings change as we change. As we change how we think about life and what we do, those things determine how we feel. It's not just your circumstances that determine how you feel. It's more how you think about them that determines how you feel than the circumstances themselves. This is the truth. And so you can have that loving feeling again. I got to hurry. I know there's another little book. I won't take time to read a quote. There's another little book out there called The Love Dare. If you're in a marriage that's struggling, I'd encourage you to check that one out as it dares you to love and do the right thing. The question for today is not, have you lost that loving feeling? The question for today is, are you deciding to be loving despite how you feel? You reap what you sow and your feelings can and will change if you decide to love. Number three, genuine love is an action, not just a conversation. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let me translate that down into your relationships. So it's great that you say, I love you. You're the best. I don't know what I'd do without you. I love you so much it hurts. You're so beautiful. You're so handsome. All of those things are wonderful words. 
But if you refuse to listen to them, respect their perspectives and their feelings and requests, if you don't die to yourself to meet their needs and compassionately do whatever it is they need you to do, your words mean absolutely nothing. You can say, I love you with your words, but if your actions say, I refuse to listen to you, I refuse to acknowledge your perspective, I refuse to respect you, I refuse to change my actions in any way to accommodate your needs, values, or preferences, your words are completely canceled by your actions no matter what you say, how much you say it, or what else you do. Love is an action. It is practical. It is not just words. So love in truth with what you do, not just what you say. Listen. Be willing to change. Don't, men, stop being so arrogantly selfish. One man in the room just clapped. Let's all pray for him this week. The devil is going to tempt him this week to be very selfish. Ladies, don't expect your husband to provide all of your emotional well-being. I'm an equal opportunity employer. Come on. How many of you know we all need to learn and grow? Amen? Amen. You remember 1 Corinthians 13? Oh, we all know the love chapter, right? Listen to what it says. Love is, what is love? Love is patient, kind. Love doesn't boast, it's not proud. Love doesn't dishonor others, doesn't devalue them. Love isn't self-seeking, doesn't get angry easy, and it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Wow. In other words, love is forgiving. Notice all of those qualities are action-oriented ways of behaving toward another person. They're not just words, not just attitudes, but they are actions, which requires discipline, which brings me to number four. Genuine love is a discipline, not an automatic response. Wouldn't it be great if all that we are supposed to be as followers of Jesus just automatically happen without any effort or cooperation on our part? Wouldn't it be great if we just said, Jesus, here I am, take me, and we woke up the next day perfectly like Jesus? Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be so great. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because God made us with a will. And because God made us with a will, he wants us to exercise our will so that we be fully like him fully reflecting his image. In Philippians 2, the Holy Spirit gives us insight on this. When it says in Philippians 2, 12, it says, work out your salvation. It's God working in you, verse 13 says, but you got to work it out. You got to take what the Spirit is convicting and doing in you, and you have to discipline yourself to work it out. Like you work when you go to the gym, like you work to lose weight, like you work to earn a living. You work out your salvation, and that requires some disciplined effort on our part. We're commanded in the Bible to grow. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, grow in the grace and knowledge of God. In 2 Peter 1, it says, make every effort to add to your faith, knowledge, self-control, goodness. We've got to work at this thing. We're commanded because we have a fallen nature that doesn't want to, and we have an enemy that gives to our fallen nature what it wants. Genuine love takes work. It is a discipline. It's not just an automatic feeling or an overwhelming impulse that grips us all the time. We have to discipline ourselves to think, to say no to our selfishness, our laziness, our feelings in order to love other people the way they should be loved. We have to be thoughtful before we speak. We have to be thoughtful before we post. Why am I posting this? What am I trying to accomplish with this? Who am I going to affect with this post? What's my motive for putting it on here? Sorry. Just a little ticked off at some posts this morning. The Holy Spirit will help us. He is at work within us. He will empower us if we'll make the effort to depend on him. It will take discipline to love your spouse. 
It'll take discipline to love your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, your fellow churchman, who, yes, is annoying at times. You won't be able to just go home and kick your shoes off all the time and act as if you're single and live alone. No, you'll have to work at being thoughtful and kind and willing to listen and get involved and understand and show compassion and do what needs to be done. That's what love is. Love is an action. It's a choice. It's a discipline. But you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Number five, I'm quitting. Genuine love is a gift and a fruit of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. It's something the Holy Spirit creates in us. This kind of love that I'm talking about is not natural to us. It's not natural to us. What is natural to us is to live by our feelings. If we feel loving, we'll act loving. If we don't feel like it, we won't. That's natural to us. It's what our human nature does. But this kind of love I'm talking about, genuine love, is the love that comes from God, who has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit as we trust the Lord Jesus. 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. As we stay connected in fellowship with the Lord and seeking him with our hearts, the Holy Spirit pours his love into us and enables us to love even though others may not be very lovable at the time. Galatians 5, 24 tells us that love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Can I just ask you quickly, what's the difference between a work and a fruit? Galatians 5, 22 says the works of the flesh are obvious, and it talks about, uh, it talks about sexual immorality and, and uh, uh, lying and murder. It says the, the, the work of the flesh. What's the difference between a fruit and a work? Well, a fruit has to do with the, the inward quality or nature of something. The work is just the evidence of what's inside. And so unless I am born again, unless I go and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to have mercy on me, to save me, to correct me, to to give me a new heart, a new spirit, unless I ask the Holy Spirit to work within me, it will not be natural for me, and it will never be natural for me. But the Bible says in Galatians, if I will walk according to, to the Spirit, if I'll depend on the Holy Spirit to help me, if I will look to the Lord primarily first and foremost, if I'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, in a world that is crazy about the here and now, in the world that's caught up with money, success, sex, pleasure, stuff, with the world can't see anything except what's right in front of them and what they feel about it. If I'll be a follower of Jesus Christ, I'll lay aside my feelings, my pride. I'll wash feet of people that are going to crucify me because that's what real love does. And then real love can be infused into our relationships and we can be in a place of romance that we never thought we could be. Because God is a God of miracle love. The bottom line is that genuine love, the self-sacrificing, unconditional, persevering love that I've been talking about in this, in this sermon is the result of the creative energy of the Holy Spirit. None of us will love genuinely all the time or consistently. None of us can do that. I close with this one quick little quote from Craig Rochelle in his book. He says he was doing a wedding one day and he, as he was reading his notes, he suddenly realized a typo in his notes. Here's what he said. I saw a, glare, a glaring typo in my notes as I was doing the wedding without realizing it until that moment. I had accidentally written that the two, that the quote, the two would be untied. Of course, I intended to write, they two will be united. Thankfully, I had the presence of mind not to read it as it was written, but to correct this important detail on the fly. I probably hesitated for a moment. I made the adjustment, but I was glad I did. I didn't blurt out what I had mistakenly written. And after the ceremony, I showed the couple the mistakes in my notes, and we both noticed that only one small letter was out of place. When the I was in the proper place, the word said united. And when the I was in the wrong place, 
it said untied. It may sound corny, but this typo illustrates the truth. No matter what else is happening in a marriage or a friendship or a relationship, if I is not in the right place, both will become untied. And if I am not fully surrendering to God and making him my one, then I can never truly love my two with his unconditional love. Depending on where the eye lands, the marriage can be secure and firmly grounded or it can be loose and separated. We've got to decide to love. And so in conclusion, you can have and express genuine love despite your current feelings or circumstances, whether your marriage, your friendships within the church, if you'll evaluate others from God's perspective, if you'll decide to love them based on God's love for you and discipline yourself to do it, taking the appropriate actions and carry out those actions in faith. We live this life by faith, not by feeling. If you'll do it by faith, you'll begin to experience the miraculous work of God because genuine love is possible because God genuinely loves you. Despite all of your sin, all of your rebellion, all of the secret sins that you are currently committing, all that's in your heart that is not right before God, all of your hardness of heart toward him and other people, the way you've treated others, gossip about them this week, made false assumptions about their motives and their hearts, the cheating that you're doing. Despite all of that, Jesus died for you. He loves you deeply. He wants you to know him in a personal and real way. He wants you to spend eternity with him. Have you trusted Jesus Christ yet? Today, Valentine's Day, be a great day to do it. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. Let's take a moment to talk about your next steps. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today, hey, we love to celebrate with you and help you on your journey. Simply text the word follower to 97000. You'll receive helpful resources on following Jesus. Thank you for watching, but we love to see you in person next week.